by step with the project. And this complete series, we're going to go and complete in flat eight hours. So in eight hours, you know, we'll be completing most of the important patterns and architecture pattern in this project, you know, which we're going to just start. Now, the first question which will probably come into your mind is that, is it really possible to cover all the design pattern in eight hours and that also in a single project and that also with architecture pattern? My answer is no, no, not at all. But in this project, you know, we will be covering almost 60% of the Gang of Four design pattern plus some other patterns which are other than Gang of Four. As well as we will be covering at least 40 to 50% of the architecture patterns. So yes, it is not possible to cover all the patterns in a project, you know, because design patterns cannot be forcibly used in a project, right? But I can tell you that in whatever project you're working at this moment, at least 20 to 30 percent design patterns are already available. So why this project, my goal is to give you an actual idea of how design pattern and architecture patterns are used in a project. But in case you are concerned saying that, no, I want to learn all the design patterns and that also I want to go step by step. What you can do is you can follow our video series, you know, which we have on questmonvideo.com, you know, where we have explained 40 to 50 design patterns. So you can see here factory pattern, abstract factory builder, prototype, adapter, decorator, you know, name that pattern and it has been completed in this series, right? Now, there are, there are two ways of learning design patterns. One is if you, if you are a person who wants to go concept by concept, code by code, then here it is. You can see that log into your Quest Video account and see this section step by step like this. And the other way is by doing a project. Take up a project, start coding and let the design patterns fall naturally along the way. But now, if you are asking me the suggestion, if you're asking me saying that, tell us, so what is good? Is going code by code and pattern by pattern is good or the project-based approach is good? My personal choice is the project-based approach. So start with the project-based approach, but as I've told that I can complete 60 to 70% design pattern, the remaining 30% are still left out, right? So those 30% design pattern, you can go and watch from here. And second, what I'll be doing, you know, when I'm teaching you this project, I will be telling you to go and see more about the design pattern in this section. So I'll be guiding you at right places to hop to this series and then come back in the project. So my advice here would be to go via the project-based approach and not via design pattern after design pattern approach. I'll tell you why. Design patterns are thought processes. And thought processes you know, cannot be explained via just sample code or PPTs or some UML diagrams. If you see on the internet, a lot of people explain design patterns by showing UML diagrams by showing examples like cars and trees and rivers, you know, which does not make any sense. We need to do a real project. We need to feel design pattern. We need to understand it that in, in what kind of scenario it has to be used. So the best way to learn design pattern is by doing a project. So I would suggest that you follow this video series and as time comes, I will tell you to go and see the appropriate design pattern from this section here, right? Now, before I move ahead, uh, let us, you know, just talk about one myth, you know, which people have about design patterns. A lot of people think that, you know, in order to do a good architecture or create a good architecture, we need to implement all design patterns in a project. Also, I have seen that some of the developers try to force design patterns. They say, oh, come on, let's implement factory pattern. Oh, come on, let's go ahead and implement singleton pattern. But the fact is, patterns come out naturally. They are completely on demand as per the scenario. So it is a very horrible myth that you need to force design pattern or you need to implement design patterns possibly in your project or implement all design patterns in your project. But the fact is that patterns are natural and they should come on demand. Now, before we move ahead and we start defining design patterns, we start looking at the project. Let me uh, spend two or three minutes here discussing about difference between design pattern, architecture pattern and architecture style. Believe me guys, I have worked with so many developers across different geographical location, with different culture. But when it com comes about differentiating between these three things, people just use these words interchangeably. So these three things, they must be looking very similar for you, but they have a huge difference between them. When you say design pattern, design pattern is actually at a code level. So when someone says, okay, this is a factory design pattern, he should actually show you some kind of a pseudo code. He should show you some kind of a logic. When you say it's an architecture pattern, then it's only block level diagrams. For example, model view controller is an architecture pattern. Where we say, okay, there is a controller, then there is a model, then there is a view. The first hit comes to the controller and then it picks up the model and the view. So over there, you know, we just draw 
block diagrams. It's a 30,000 feet level view of your project. And when we talk about architecture style, they are just principles. They are just one-liners. For example, REST is an architecture style which follows HTTP protocol. So remember, design pattern, it is at the, at the code level, at the pseudo code level. Somebody has to give you some kind of a pseudo code, then it becomes a design pattern. Architecture pattern, just overall blocks, like as I've said, you know, model view, view model, or UI layer, and then model layer, and then your data access layer. Now, uh, you know, these layers, how they are implemented, what code goes into that, that is not shown here. And architecture principles, it is just principles, just one liners, you know, which we need to follow. Now, how do you follow it by using C Sharp or Java or whatever, right? It is all up to you. So design pattern at a very code level, architecture pattern, you know, it's more of a 30,000 feet level and then architecture style, which is just principle. So next time, you know, when you say that, okay, this is a design pattern, I expect code from you. Next time when you say, okay, this is an architecture pattern, I expect some kind of a higher level diagram from you, right? And uh, here are some examples of design pattern, architecture pattern and architecture style. So architecture patterns are normally your Yang of four pattern, like factory pattern, singleton pattern. Architecture pattern are more block level, you know, which says, okay, model view controller, model view, view model, model view presenter. Uh, and the architecture style is just style, you know, it's just one liners, it is principles. Uh, you know, so for example, REST is architectural style which gives importance to HTTP, you know, so we have REST, we have SOA, we have IOC, so these are principles, these are architectural style. So before we move ahead with the project, let us go and define design pattern. If you see the official design pattern definition on the web, if you go and search design pattern definition, everywhere you'll find this definition saying that design patterns are time-tested solutions for software architecture problems. Again, I repeat, you know, most of the times, you know, this is the definition what is given on the internet. Design patterns are time-tested solution for software architecture problems. But believe me, guys, after working 15, 20 years in IT industry and after doing a lot of designing and architecting, I came to one conclusion that design pattern is nothing but it is object programming principles. It helps you to understand object programming problems easily. So let me put an, an unofficial definition ahead. Uh, must be it's because of my experience I'm putting this definition. Design patterns are nothing but they are best practices or time-tested practices for object-oriented programming problems. And when you're doing design patterns, you know, you will suddenly feel that, okay, this is polymorphism. So this is polymorphism plus inheritance. Oh, this looks to be encapsulation. So, you know, as you do pattern after pattern, at one moment of time, you'll realize that it is nothing but interfaces, abstract classes, inheritance, polymorphism, encapsulation. So yes. Design patterns, when you start doing practically, it is nothing but solving object programming problems in a much better manner. And in case you are too worried about this definition, what I've given, because definitely I'm not the official person to define definitions here. But, you know, people who actually created Gang of Four, even they have admitted in their interview. And if you go and see this small interview, you know, where, uh, you know, one of the persons from Gang of Four, that is Mr. Gamma, uh, when he was interviewed by Bill, you know, he said that patterns as a whole can help people learn object-oriented thinking. It can help you to leverage polymorphism, you know, help you to uh, design composition, delegations, help you to make a more pluggable uh, system. So, you know, it is not just my feeling, my understanding here, but it also comes from the main source. You know, they also admit that, yes, it is nothing but it helps you to think object programming problems in a much better manner. So without wasting time, let us go ahead and discuss about the project. So this project is an extremely simple project. And uh, in order to make the learnings easy and to not complicate things on the first go, what I've done is that I have divided this project into various phases. So at this moment, we'll concentrate just on phase one. In phase one, you know, we have just six to seven requirements. Okay. So let us concentrate on that requirements and let us try to, you know, architect the system and let us see what design pattern comes up. So what is this, this cool shop project? This cool shop project is, is, a, is a small software which a company wants to make. This company is a large retail shopping mall and it has chain malls in Mumbai and Pune city. And the company wants a very, very simple customer management system for their shops. Uh, and uh, it, it has the following requirements. You know, which they want to fulfill. So first requirement number one, application would be capturing three fields, customer name, the name of the customer, phone number, bill amount, you know, how much is the bill, bill date and the address of the customer. So five fields, you know, this application should capture in phase one. The second requirement is in phase one, there are two types of customers, you know, which they have included. Okay. So one is a lead. A lead is a person who comes to the shop but he does not buy anything. He just inquires. And a customer is a person who actually comes and buys things and does a financial transaction. So requirement number two, the system at this moment, you know, should support two types of customers. You know, one is a lead and the other is a customer. 
Now, the customer and lead have different types of validation. They differ in terms of validation. Now, a lead who comes to the shop, you know, he does not buy anything, right? So, for him, bill amount and bill date is not compulsory. But yes, at least he has to give his name and phone number so that tomorrow probably my marketing people can call him up and uh, say that, you know, there is a discount or something. So, when it is a lead, only customer name and phone number is compulsory. But for customer, all the fields are compulsory. And the system should have a provision to add new validations rule seamlessly. Right? Seamlessly. This is very important. So, in other words, you know, tomorrow if I say, okay, now I want, I want to go and add a new customer type called as gold customer, you know, for him, these, these validation rules are true. So, system should be flexible enough, you know, to add this new rule without doing a lot of changes across the system. That is the third requirement. The fourth requirement is system should, should have the ability to add, update and delete customer data. The fifth requirement, you know, which is again a very important requirement. For now, the system will use SQL Server and uh, to connect to SQL Server, it will use ADO.NET as a data layer technology. But tomorrow, the system could probably use new data access technologies like Entity Framework or LinkU. So this migration from one data layer to other data layer should also happen seamlessly. You know, we don't have to do a lot of changes across the system. So that is requirement number five. And the last requirement is system should have an ability of cancelling a modification. So if a customer, if, if the end user is going and, and editing a record here, right? So if there are some issues with the updated values, you know, he should have the ability to cancel. So this project basically has six requirements. First, the, the, there are five fields. Second one, there are two types of customers at this moment. With, they are having different, different validations. And tomorrow we should be able to plug in new customers, customer type into this. It should have the basic crude functionality. And the fifth point is that basically we should be able to migrate from one data access layer technology to other data access layer technologies seamlessly. So this is the phase one requirement of this project. And in case you know it is not clear from the video, this requirement, you can go ahead and you can download this requirement from questpondvg.com. It's a very simple one page of Word document in where we have put this requirement. So you can read through this because the other part of the whole video will revolve around this project. So if this project is not understood, then you won't love the further classes, right? So it's important that you understand this project, read it once and twice, and then continue with the video. So let us move ahead first and let us first try to identify classes. Let us identify our entities. And then as we do the project, you know, let design pattern come, you know, when it has to come. So first thing is to identify entities. Now, what exactly are entities? Entities are nothing but, you know, they are things what you see in the real world. For example, a person is an entity. A living object is an entity, city. So these things are actually entities. Entities in technical world or in object programming world, we also term them as objects. In short, entities are nothing but nouns. A good architect, when he reads a requirement, one of the things, you know, which keeps going at his back end is that whatever are the nouns, you know, they become classes and entities. So you can see, you know, from our cool shop project at this moment, Mumbai, Pune, lead, customer, you know, these are some of the nouns I have identified. Now, remember that this approach has to be taken very, very wisely. You can come up with a lot of unconcerned nouns, you know, which has nothing to do with your software. For example, I can see that, you know, there are nouns like, you know, the cool shop or Mumbai and Pune, but they really don't have direct impact on my project. Must be there are some data which I will store in my database, like a city master or something, but they really don't have an impact as such on my code. But you can see like now customer and lead are definitely you no know, nouns, you know, which I would be uh, dealing with in my project. Right. So from here, I'm dropping off two, three nouns like Mumbai, Pune, Cool Shop. But yes, these two nouns, that is customer and lead, are definitely very important for me. So the first thing is to identify entities, try to first identify the nouns. And this approach, please do take up very carefully, right? Um, so that you know you don't come up with unnecessary nouns, you know, which you will try to create entities of. Now these objects or these entities needs to have properties and methods. To identify the properties, the way to go ahead is by identifying pronouns. Pronouns actually talk more about the noun. For example, you can see we have customer name. So customer name actually talks more about the noun. We have customer address, you know, that talks more about the noun. So whatever talks more about the noun becomes properties. And whatever actions, you know, these nouns are doing, for example, ordering a product or asking for a refund, those becomes the methods of the objects or entities. So just I'm trying to lay down a rule here. Rule number one for architects, for people who are trying to become architects or people who are trying to learn design patterns. Whenever you take a requirement at the back end somewhere, don't take it as a hard and fast tool, but at, but at back end somewhere, you should think about that your nouns actually becomes objects. Pronouns becomes the properties for that object and actions becomes, or the verbs becomes the actions or the methods or the functions, you know, for that object. Now, in order that these entities, these objects, you know, become live into your computer, you need to write some kind of a code for it. 
these code or these logics you write in something called as classes. Classes are nothing but templates. So basically you write your code into the class and this class is lying into your hard disk. And then you need to instantiate this class and then your entity comes live into your RAM. So to instantiate this class, you know, we need to use something called as a new keyword. I'm sure that a lot of people who have already done programming, you know, they are aware of what I'm saying. So basically, if you ask me, object of the programming is a three-step process. The first thing is you need to create the class, write the code for it. Then you need to instantiate the class. And then you can go and start performing operations on that object or on that entity. Now, creation of objects goes through three phases. Okay, so when you say that you want to actually make an entity live inside your computer, you need to actually at least do these steps at least. The first thing is you need to go and write a class. You know, you need to go and write the logic for that entity. Second, you need to go and use the new keyword and instantiate that entity inside your computer. And the last one is, you know, you need to go and interact with those objects and achieve the necessary functionality. So any kind of uh, object programming problems or as a design problems which comes into the class creation process, uh, which is more static in nature, comes or falls into structural design pattern category. So we have a structural design pattern category which will address problems regarding class creation, inheritance, uh, you know, so those kind of structural issues, they will come into structural design category. Second one is object creation, instantiation, instantiating the object. So when you're using the new keyword, you know, any kind of problem associated with instantiation will come into creational design category. And finally, you know, when your object starts running, you know, they use polymorphism and uh, they do typecasting and etc. So on runtime, if you have any kind of architectural problems, it will come into the behavioral category. So you can see, as I've said previously also, design pattern is nothing but it is object programming. So it, it, it solves problems around object programming. So you can see by this view here or by this image here, you can easily make out that design pattern will revolve around classes, objects and instantiation. So now that we have analyzed the requirement and when we read the requirement, we use the noun, pronoun and the verb approach uh, to, to conclude entities. And we said that we have two types of entities. One is a customer and the other one is a lead. So let us go ahead and create a class library and uh, let us go ahead and try to create the business layer. Business layer means, you know, the library in which our in which our business logic will reside. So I'm going to go here and create a class library or DLL. And let me name this project as customer project phase one. OK, this is the phase one of the project. Now, this class library, which I've created at this moment, uh, I would like to go and name this library as the library you know, where my business logic will reside. So let me go and put a very nice namespace here. So rather than just putting customer project phase one, I would like to name this namespace as my middle layer. So uh, a lot of people can say this is the middle layer. Some people term this as the domain layer. Some people term this as a business layer, whatever layer you want to term this as. But this is the layer you know, where your business logic will reside. So as we said, we have two kinds of classes, uh, two classes, I'm sorry, at this moment. One is the customer class and the other one is a lead class, right? And if you remember, you know, we said that, you know, there are five properties which we had identified by using the pronoun approach. We said, you know, that we need the customer name, we need the phone number, we need the bill amount, we need the bill date, we need the address and so on. So you can see all of these five properties here. And also, uh, you know, for the lead also, we have the same kind of properties, right? We said that lead and customer are different types of customer. So the, the customer is actually the customer who actually buys it. While lead is a kind of a customer, you know, who actually just comes and inquires about it, but he actually does not do a transaction. Now I do understand that, you know, a lot of people would be screaming over there <laughs> saying that, hey, you have duplicated all these properties. You need to move it to a common class and so on. Believe me, guys, I'm going to do that. But the best way to learn programming is, or the best way to learn architecting is by doing mistakes and then gradually improving on the top of it, right? So let me commit these mistakes. Let me see that, you know, how I can improve on it in the later stages. And in that way, you can also see this architecture evolution. So we identified the entities by using the noun uh, strategy. We identified the properties of the entities by using the pronoun strategy. We identified the actions, you know, by using the verb strategy. Now it is time to identify the relationship between these entities. Now, primarily, uh, there are two kinds of relationship between entities. One is a, is a relationship and the other one is a using relationship or has a relationship. For example, you can see on your uh, video there, Shiv is a son of his father. So it is more of a parent-child relationship. While Shiv uses a car or Shiv has a shirt, you know, it is more of a using relationship. Now, if you look at a requirement, in the requirement, it is clearly said that lead is a type of customer with less validations. I would suggest you to go and read the requirement again. It clearly says that lead is a type of customer. In other words, the lead and the customer is having a kind of a parent-child relationship. 
so probably both of these guys you know can be inherited from a common class so let us go ahead and create a common class here so i'm going to go and create a common class here called as uh, customer base right so this is a base class it's a class you know which will have all of these properties over here right and both these classes that is the customer class will inherit from the customer base as well as the lead class will inherit from the customer base so both of them will actually inherit from the customer base class and also we had one requirement regarding validation right we said that when it is a only a lead then only customer name and phone number is compulsory but for a customer all the fields are compulsory so that means you know the difference between the customer and the lead is in terms of validation right so what i'll do is in the customer base let me go here and de uh, define a method here saying um, validate right so this method will uh, help to validate a customer but you know uh, this method uh, would be overridden by the customer and, and the lead as per their requirement right so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go and make this method as virtual okay so by defining a method as virtual uh, what happens is you know your child classes means for example you can see over here i have the customer class so the customer class can go and override the validate method and you can put all the validations here while the lead class will only go and validate for customer name and phone number right and in the base class uh, because this is a base class what i will do is over here i will just go and uh, throw a new exception saying that uh, not implemented right uh, in other words you know this will be implemented by the child classes so in the customer all the validations will happen so in other words here uh, the customer name is compulsory right so if the customer name length is equal to zero then i will go and uh, throw a new exception saying uh, customer name is required and in the same way i have put validations for all the other fields as well so you can see phone number is compulsory bill amount is compulsory bill date cannot exceed today's date address is compulsory etc but for the lead only the name and the phone number is compulsory right so you can see now we have the customer and lead which are actually concrete types and they are inheriting from the customer base and then they are overriding the validate method you know as per their requirements as per their need so now let us go ahead and uh, create a user interface and in the user interface let us go ahead and consume this business logic you know what we have created right so this is actually our middle layer so let me go and uh, rename this and also i would like to mention here i'm creating this project in visual studio 2010 uh, why am I creating in a backward version so that you know people who are using 2012, 2013, and 2015, or must be 2016 tomorrow, you can easily migrate this project and uh, see the code. You know, so I'm trying to create in a version which is five years back. You know, so that you can just do a next next wizard and see this code. Uh, let me also go and rename this class here to like customer.cs or something, right? So let me go ahead here and add a new project. So let me add a Windows form here. So I'll say win form customer right and there is a form let me rename this form to a nice name so actually i'm creating a windows ui to consume this middle layer or or the domain objects what we have created at this moment ui for me is irrelevant actually because i want to just ensure that my middle layer and my data access layer are properly uh, reusable right but i do need a ui to test it right so i'm taking the win form but feel free to use other user interfaces like asp.net web form or must be console applications etc so i'll say uh, frm customer and on this form you know you can see i have i have put all the necessary user interface you know which will help us to fill data into our domain object or into our customer class right so here is my ui so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go and consume this middle layer inside my ui win form customer so i'm going to go and consume uh, this middle layer inside my WinForm customer here and over here i will say using middle layer right so uh now remember that uh we have two types of customers you know one is a lead and uh, one is a, a a simple customer right so what i've done is uh in this ui i have created a very simple combo box so you can see that i have a simple uh drop down i'll say rather and uh, this drop down helps me to select uh you know what kind of customer i want to use so if i select lead and if i do validate then accordingly the lead validations will fire and if i go and select customer then customer validations will fire right so what i'm going to do is i'll, I'll go back to my ui so depending on situation i will say your private customer so either this ui will go and create a customer object 
or probably it will go and create a lead object right so in this combo box selected change event what i'll say here is if the customer type dot text which is selected if it is customer then please go ahead and uh, create the object of the customer or else go ahead and create the object of the lead so i'll say a cast is equal to new customer or else go ahead and create the object of lead All right and um, in the validate button again here also depending on what is selected i will either call the validate of the customer or i will either call the validate of the lead now there is one big problem with the approach at this moment before i talk about the problem let me talk about what is a sign of a good software architecture if you want to see you know or if you want to test i will say that a software architecture is good or not you should see that how the software architecture reacts you know when changes happens whenever a change happens in a software and if you have to change at 10 places then there is a problem with the software architecture if you see at this moment tomorrow if i go and add a new customer type over here so let us say i go ahead and i add a new customer class called as cold customer then look at the places you know where i have to make changes first thing change number 1 i have to go and add that new type here in the form second i need to go and add in my combo selected event i need to go and add one more if condition then in the validate event i need to add one more if condition so i have to make changes at three places and please note at this moment this is a very very simple form if i have 10 such forms like this you can think about that you know what kind of changes can happen in my system so a good software architecture is tested you know when the changes happen and if you are changing in a lot of places that means you have not architected your software well so first thing is you know let us see that if we can minimize these changes from at least you know 3 to 1 okay so let us go step by step so at least you know can we bring down these number of code changes right so the first thing what i can really do over here is i can use polymorphism so in other words if you remember both of our classes that is uh, customer and lead inherits from the customer base class right so what i can do is i can just go and create one reference for the whole ui so i can say okay this is customer base and depending on situation the customer base can now point towards a uh, new customer or he can point towards a lead right and then in the validate i can just say cus dot validate so if you see now when i go and add a new type right i have to only go and change in this section here that's it so you can see because of polymorphism this is polymorphism right you know wherein the parent class can point towards his child classes on runtime what do you mean by polymorphism polymorphism means change as per situation so you can see here you know my cust object is actually of customer base type and depending on situations it, it can point to customer or it can point to the lead uh, object now one of my personal belief is that the biggest gift from object programming is polymorphism if you see polymorphism in our real world also in our real life polymorphism means you know depending on situation you change yourself for example at this moment i am teaching you so i will not be talking about my family work so i am a teacher at this moment but the time i go and meet my kids i play with them i don't talk about my office work so at that time i i am a dad and i i just want to ensure that i don't talk any kind of official work so in in real life also people achieve decoupling decoupling means you know that you know one whatever is happening in your office you don't take it home or whatever is happening in your home you don't take it office when you actually do polymorphism and the same here in object oriented world also polymorphism is the biggest gift by which you can achieve decoupling right by by which you can ensure that when change happens at one place it does not get get you know does not go all over the places right so here also you know by using polymorphism you can see at this moment i'm using polymorphism and because of that i have minimized my changes from 3 to 1 right but still i have to still make changes in other words if you see now if somebody goes and adds a new type so the first thing is he has to go and add the class over here after that he has to again go back and add a new if condition here in this combo change and think about it you know if you have 10 screens like that then you have to go and do it do it at 10 places right so somehow we have to also get rid of this if condition as well from this ui now in order to remove this if condition from here what we really need to do is we need to get rid of this new keyword remember what is the whole goal of this exercise we are trying to do removing if conditions or removing the 
strongly typed classes, right? Or concrete classes. The goal is that when I go and add a new customer type, I shouldn't be making changes here. So if I'm if, if I don't want to make changes in my UI, then I need to get rid of these final classes or concrete classes, right? And uh, in order to get rid of these classes, I need to somehow ensure that you know the creation of these objects you know goes into some central class. So in other words, I need to give this object creation to some other library, right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go and add a new class here or a new library here who will take away this object creation process from here into that class library. Now, I would like to go and name this class library as factory. Why factory? Because it creates things, right? So I'm going to go here and add a new project. And I will say this project name as factory, factory customer. And uh, in this, <clears throat> let me go and create this class as a static class. So I'll say this is my factory, right? So this factory class will be responsible for my object creation, right? So I'm going to go and add a reference to the middle layer here. So now what I will do here is I will say public create, right? So create the customer depending on the type of customer right and what i will do is i will move this if condition from here to this factory class so over here now i'll say okay if the type of customer if the type of cust is customer then return a new customer or else return a new lead right so you can see now this class here this factory class here is taking all the responsibilities of creating the object. So he is aware of all the strong type objects. So in other words, tomorrow if you add a new type, you will just go and add one more if condition here. But when he returns this strong type, he will always return it as the parent base class. Polymorphism. Remember, the base of decoupling is polymorphism. So you can see now, tomorrow if I go and add a new type, he will always go and return only customer base. So my UI now can become something like this. So I can see here, so my UI will now go and refer the factory customer class or the library. So I will say here using factory customer and then in the customer type, in, in the customer uh, type selected event of the combo box, I can say here, please use the factory and create the object. So you can see now in my UI, I have no reference of the customer class. So you can see now, or the lead class, because we can just search for the lead. So you can see there is no reference of the strongly typed classes, right? So you can see now by using this simple factory pattern, we are able to decouple the user interface from the strongly typed classes. So tomorrow, if somebody goes and adds a new customer type here, he has to just go and add that if condition here, and that's it. And all other consumers so it can be a ui it can be a batch process it can be anyone they don't have to worry you know what kind of type is coming from the factory the factory takes the responsibility of creating the object now there is one serious problem with this factory class and the problem is the if condition we somehow have to get rid of this if condition and uh, we need some better approach here now the good news is if you have polymorphism in action then you can get rid of the if conditions so if you have polymorphism and if you see lots of if conditions and case statements, that means polymorphism has not been exploited to the full. So over here, what I can do is I can go and delete this complete if condition. And I can go and create a very simple collection here of customer base type. So I can go and do something like this. I can go and create a collection base type of dictionary. Customer base is equal to new dictionary of customer base. And what I can do is in the, in the constructor, I can go and add the, the newly the, the strong types or the concrete type so i can say here okay this is new customer and this is for lead right so now we can just go ahead and uh, return the uh, customer type by just doing a lookup so so we don't need now the if condition so i can just say a return cast now remember that uh, this cast 
here is a is, is a non static variable right and uh, inside the static methods you can only uh, access static variable so we need to make it static so i'll say cast of uh, type cast and here it returns the type now you can see we don't need any more if condition it can be just removed by simple lookup and the lookup will work why because you know polymorphism is happening internally so basically he will do a lookup it will give out customer but that will get automatically typed to a customer base right so over here now again if you see it's the same kind of output or oh, there are some errors let us see what errors are there let me go and first rebuild the solution let us see what errors we have static classes cannot have instance constructors so that is right so basically this has to be static right so let me do a rebuild now again and let me do a fi so now if i do a lead it goes it looks up the collection and gives me back a lead type if i do a lookup of a customer so there is a customer he again does a lookup it goes looks up and it gives me a customer type so you can see now we have a factory class centralized all the new new keywords are centralized there and also we successfully got rid of that if condition this getting rid of this if condition by using polymorphism is termed as rip pattern rip means replace if with polymorphism this centralization of object creation is termed as factory pattern but remember that you know there are two kinds of factory pattern one is what is discussed by gang of four and this one here is a simple factory pattern so this factory here is termed as a simple factory pattern so what i'll do is you know all over the project i will just put this word design pattern right and i will put the name of the pattern design pattern and name of the pattern so that tomorrow if you want to just go and see if you do it if you just do a control shift i and if you just search for uh design pattern you know you should be able to straight forward go and see the references right now this factory class can be improved in terms of performance if you look at this moment this customer collection is loaded irrespective you want it or you don't want it i want that the customer type should be loaded only on demand so in other words when somebody calls this create method at that time the customer collection should be loaded so what i'm going to do is i'm going to go and control x this i will remove this constructor and over here i will say if the cust dot count is equal to zero right then go and load the types so you can see that when somebody calls the create method right at that time only the customer types are loaded or else you know they are not loaded you know without any reasons right this pattern is termed as lazy loading so again one more design pattern here lazy loading the opposite of lazy loading can be termed as eager loading so lazy loading means you know when the objects are needed you know they are loaded or else you know they are not loaded okay so you can see three design patterns we have covered at this moment factory pattern replace if with polymorphism and lazy loading pattern now very quickly i would like to make a statement here one is you know design pattern the other is you should know the automation for the design pattern it is very important that if you have automation for the design pattern you should be using that and not actually coding from scratch so you can see here for example for lazy loading in c sharp you know we have a keyword called as lazy so rather than writing such kind of a if condition and then uh, checking it and then loading it you can just go and use that lazy keyword so i would i would give this you as a homework we have a video in questpon vd which talks about the lazy keyword so use that lazy keyword and replace this if condition of the lazy loading pattern here okay so remember one is uh you should know the pattern and the other is in case you know there is some ready made framework or some ready made component try to use that component because components are time tested you don't need to reinvent the wheel from scratch so take this as a homework uh, go ahead and replace this if condition of lazy design pattern by using the lazy keyword of shisha now let us quickly go and test our application so what i will do is in the validate uh, we are already getting the type right so let us create a method here saying set customer and uh, so this method will say cus dot uh, customer name is equal to txt customer name dot text cus dot uh, phone number txt phone number dot text this method here actually goes and takes a value from the ui and sets it to the object right so before i call the validate i would like to just go and call this set customer here right and let us quickly go and test this so basically if he is a lead then customer name is compulsory oh so if he is a lead then 
customer name is compulsory right there it is if i put the customer name phone number is also compulsory but then address is not compulsory so it is working but the time i say this is a customer right then even the bill amount is required it cannot be zero even the address is required so you can see now uh, you know depending on what kind of type i'm selecting here he is calling the factory factory gives him that type and depending on the type the validations are happening and and you can see if i tomorrow go and add a new customer type i don't have to make any change in the ui in the ui i just have to go and add that type over here and only what i have to change is in the factory class i need to go in the factory class and just go ahead and add the new type into my collection here right so this brings us to this one hour of learn design pattern step by step and in this one hour believe me guys you have literally crossed the sea because i'm not teaching you design pattern step by step i'm not teaching you design pattern academically i'm teaching you design pattern practically so once you see these examples you will never forget you know how to use design pattern in your project tomorrow so basically first we started with design pattern we defined design pattern and we said that design pattern is nothing but learning object oriented programming in a better way so they are time tested solutions for object oriented programming problems and then we said you know the design pattern falls into three categories one is the structural category you know so at the time when we build our classes when we write our entities so any kind of problems you know that occurs during that phase will be solved by using the structural design pattern category then we then we said you know there is a second category called as creational pattern which which actually revolves around the new keyword and then we said that there is something called as behavioral pattern which actually talks about the problems around dynamic nature of objects after that you know we also defined what is the difference between design pattern architecture pattern and architecture style then we moved ahead and we identified the entities and the objects and the classes by using the noun pronoun and the verb approach after that we identified the relationship between these entities we said that there are two kinds of relationships one is a is a relationship and one is a has a relationship so one is using inheritance and the other is using you know aggregation association composition so it is more of a using relationship after that we went ahead and we created the ui so we we created the classes and properties we created the ui then we said that you know we are having uh, problems with the new customer type so we said that you know if new customer types get added then we have to make changes all over so we went ahead and we created the simple factory class the simple factory class is nothing but it actually uh, collects all the new keyword into a centralized location afterwards we moved ahead we said that okay this simple factory class is looking good but we need to replace that if if condition it was it, that the if it has it had a if condition and that if condition will increase you know as new types gets added so we replaced the if with polymorphism that is a second pattern which we implemented with third we said you know how about improving the performance of this factory class so rather than loading the objects always how about loading them on demand so we implemented the lazy design pattern so we have more 7 hours still pending so let me talk about what i'm going to cover in the next coming hours in the next coming hour i will be covering something called a strategy pattern because if you look at this moment the validations are coupled tightly coupled with the entities so we will look into that you know how to use strategy pattern and improve on these validations we will also see how we can go and automate the factory pattern class the simple factory pattern class because at this moment if you see you know we are writing a collection then we are doing a lookup and what not right uh, but in reality if you think about it you know if you want to go and create a lot of these factories like this you would end up into a lot of custom coding so as i've said in this class also one is you know the design pattern and other is you know how to automate that design pattern so also what we'll do in the coming hours is we'll try to automate that factory class we'll try to remove that collection we'll we'll try to remove that lookup right and third we will also implement you know some simple patterns like uh, prototype pattern and memento pattern so again the next coming hour is more uh, exciting it is more adventurous and uh, we will be learning all of this design pattern practically and not just theoretically and again don't forget in case you want to go and learn pattern by pattern please go ahead and see this video series you know where we have explained pattern by pattern so you can take up one pattern we have shown a sample code for it you can understand it then there is a second pattern third pattern and so on so if you want to learn pattern by pattern go through that video series if you want to really see patterns happening then this is the video series which you have to go through so thank you so much for bearing me for one hour and uh, if you really like this series then again bear me for the next coming hour as well right so seven hours still pending and uh, if you don't give up then i will also not give up okay so if you have the zeal to learn design patterns actually and practically then i have the zeal to teach you and in case you like this series in case you like this one hour what you have learned please go to facebook.com/questpond and say that okay i completed one hours i liked it and i'm waiting for the other series 
or else you know in case if you have any issues and concerns you can also raise those concerns on the facebook page thank you so much so let us complete the seven hours and let us become a real real architect and let us become a person who knows design pattern actually and not just theoretically thank you so much in this video we'll try to understand what exactly is the concept of lazy loading now lazy loading you can think about it's a design pattern or it's a concept where we delay the loading of the objects until the point where we need it or i'll say in other words on demand object loading rather than loading the objects unnecessarily now to demonstrate lazy loading what i've done is i've created a very simple uh, class here called as a customer class and this customer class has lots of order objects and if you watch